Welcome back to The Move, or I've been through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Koo, and in today's episode, we're talking about that one time in the Bible where Isaac invests in Bitcoin and it pays off in a big way. For morning, what are we talking about? Genesis chapter 26, verses 12 to 35. Got the one and the only Pastor Kessia Rain on the microphone today. Fun little trivia. Do you happen to know, Pastor Kessia, what is the first thing ever purchased by Bitcoin? Oh, I do not do you, have do you, any do you, idea. Do you know much about Bitcoin? At all? Are you invested in Bitcoin at all? <laughs> no. <laughs> and no. We have about uh, maybe about $100 in Bitcoin. Uh, and you know, I don't know that. I, I don't even think I remember the, the login for my Coinbase uh, app. So I don't even know if we're doing well or if we're not doing well. But today's reading reminded me of Bitcoin because it talks about how basically um, Isaac is basically in, like not investing, but like God blesses him. He plants crops and then it says that he's harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted. So it just seems like this thing went really, really, really well for him. So I started wondering about Bitcoin. It reminded me of story. The very first thing that was ever purchased by Bitcoin, at least that the internet has uh, fed to me, was that it was a pair of two Papa John pizzas. And the price tag, this was way back in, uh, I don't know, 2010, just uh, around that time. He paid 10,000 Bitcoins, which was at that price, $41 for these two pizzas. It was the first ever kind of verified purchase using cryptocurrency. This amount of money, 10,000 Bitcoins, I think at the height of it all was is worth or was worth somewhere in the realm of three point eight billion with a B billion dollars for two pairs of pizzas. And could you imagine being that guy spending that for two pieces? I mean, this is kind of like the whole uh, Jacob and Esau selling your birthright for uh, <laughs> for some lentils kind of. It's almost like the same thing. But anyways, I was just thinking about how, you know, the Bible seems to paint this picture that when God is with people. One of the byproducts is that they seem to flourish in many of the kind of tangible, obvious ways like wealth. And I, I think that's awesome. I love that that they're blessed in that way. But it also challenges me because I think and I take inventory of my life right now. I don't got 10,000 Bitcoins in the bank. I don't have $3.8 billion. I can't think of the last time any investment has paid off a hundred times. And I'm just like, man, you know what? It's cool that God blesses some people with wealth. But then I look at my own life and I'm like, uh, I could use some of that blessing. God, if you, if, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> So I don't know, like I've heard one of the common criticisms of like Judaism in the time of Jesus was that, you know, they had these kind of indicators of if, if you had God's favor, if you were male, if you were firstborn, if you were religious, if you were wealthy, if you were healthy, there were certain things that were indicators of God's blessing. And I can kind of get where they're, where at least the wealth part comes in, because it just talks about how God was with someone and then they were doing really, really well financially. And so I'm just wondering, maybe this isn't the point of the text, but it did get me thinking, what is the role or the relationship between God's blessings and material wealth? Ooh, wouldn't I and my bank account like to know? <laughs> um, You're not doing so hot either, huh? I mean, I'm doing okay. I have no reason to complain, but I, 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 I have, I am not enjoying the material prosperity of Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. I will there say that know. much. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think what we can say about prosperity and God's blessings is that it's not a straight line for mm. sure. And actually, if you think about the number of people where God is like, I favor you, I'm going to give you material prosperity. Like how many can you actually think of? Hmm. I can't think of more than Four. Okay, who who would make the list in your mind? Well, Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. I guess Jacob also. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was thinking of Joseph. He wasn't necessarily blessed with like in this kind of a way, but mm -hmm. he gets preserved after all of his trials. You right. know, the he Lord got is kind of with like authority Joseph. and power and prestige. Yeah. He got I think, vindicated. I think There's of that. is it Solomon? Daniel. Solomon who asked oh. Who's the one that asked for wisdom, but then ended up really, really wealthy and all that? Solomon, yeah. Yeah, that was Solomon, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you believe, you know, it, the tradition, he's the one who wrote Ecclesiastes, who was like, listen, just because you're wealthy, <laughs> like, doesn't mean anything. And also, like, just because you're smart doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy. And just because mm. you're wise doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy. And mm. just because you offer sacrifices to God doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy. So that guy who was super wealthy and super wise kind of turned the whole thing on its head. But 
that does seem to be establishing a a very real geographic land-based wealth hmm. for this family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right, right. I think it's actually probably tied to the establishment of the covenant that God is making. And he gives this covenant of blessing generally. Mm-hmm. But specifically, he he says, I'm going to bless you with land, mm-hmm. and I'm going to bless you with offspring, and I will be your God, and you'll be my people. So oh. it's... You know, these are, these are kind of the kind of required elements in order to sustain this type of lineage. You, you, you kind of need space for all the kids. Uh, you are going to need food for all these kids. That's something that's becoming more and more real as Maddie's getting bigger. He's he's coming up on one year in, in just a few short weeks, and the kid's eating a lot of food. It's starting yeah. to become a thing now. Kids be hungry. Absolutely. <laughs> they go through those growth spurts, and you're like, more? All right. Hmm. Yes. I think – and and – the the family is getting established in the land. Then they'll go through their time in Egypt and the Exodus. They'll come back to the land. And we'll see that a lot of the places where they've been and where they've established things come back to bear later once they get back in Canaan as a whole nation. Hmm. So we're going to talk, you know, we see in here, for instance, um, Beersheba is here. And so that's shown up in Genesis 21. It's back here in Genesis 26. And this becomes a place where things happen later in the Old Testament when the Hebrews are not just a a family, but they're actually a whole nation. And so Mm. I think partly the structure of the land is being established through this family. And it's interesting how it does seem like all the blessings tend to happen while they are staying in that geography. So I, I think... It makes sense what you're saying that in the moments where God has been blessing them in this specific manner, it does seem tied directly to making sure that they prosper as a nation so that the seed can, in fact, actually emerge from from this tribe. I would say, too, as we're talking about their blessings, you know, we have to recognize that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all experienced significant financial setbacks as well. So this is not just a straight line of like, blessing, 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 things are going great, 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 great. But Mm. actually, you know, uh, the story that just finished right before this is Isaac going to the Philistia because of a famine. And Abraham had to travel at least twice because of a famine in the land. Mm -hmm. Jacob has to flee into a totally different country. He gets Mm -hmm. swindled. Like even those people who are experiencing prosperity, we think of Joseph uh, lots of bad things happen to that guy in his life. We think of Daniel taken as a eunuch uh, mm. in the king's court as an exile, probably saw his family members be killed. I mean, hmm. and this is not just like, if God favors you, nothing bad will happen to you. Even these people who get material blessings had some stuff going on. Yeah, there's there's not a, the type of blanket prosperity that some uh, tele-evangelist might kind of lead us on to believe that there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Interesting. Actually, this, this kind of leads me to one of the other questions I had from this text. One of the, the the last verses I think was super interesting. Verse 34 talks about how the age of 40, Esau marries two Hittite wives, Judith mm-hmm. and Basemath, if I'm going to use the American accent. I'm sure that's pronounced differently in Hebrew. <laughs> uh, but base I like math. Basemath, though. Let's <laughs> call her that. How would, how would you say that in Hebrew? Do you know? Probably Basamat. Basamat. Okay, there you go. But I like um, base math. We're sticking base with that. Base math. It nope. just, it's literally spelled base math if you're going to use the, <laughs> the American pronunciation. But verse 35 says that Esau's wives made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. And this is a theme that we're seeing over and over and over. And it's this, this theme of kind of dysfunctional family. And this is something that I've been curious about because, you know, I don't know, the, 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 the narrative that we're taught as children who grow up in the church is that do things God's way and you'll be blessed, maybe maybe financially, like we saw at the beginning of the text. Uh, you'll be happier uh, and you'll have like a successful family unit, for example, is maybe, maybe no one would specifically tie the dot from like, if you do all the right things with Jesus, then your family is going to be perfect. I don't think that it would be tied that way, but we're certainly led to believe that your family unit will be better off when you follow God. And I'd like to believe that that's true, but the narrative 26 chapters into the book seems to be one of consistent turmoil in the family relationship department. Yes, uh, there is definitely a lot of drama happening. And this actually foreshadows the relationship between the Israelites and the Hittites Hmm. that will play out later in the Old Testament. So keep your eye out for season 
<laughs> eight through 12 of the move. Um, so that will actually play out later. But definitely we do see that there's conflict here. And I think mm. the other thing we can see is that I'm trying to think of an exception, but this conflict a lot of times seems to be because not because not despite people following God's way, but because they were not following God's way. So, you know, the difficulty between Isaac and Jacob, um, excuse me, Isaac and Jacob, between Esau and um, his brother, like despising his birthright and Esau marrying these people who are not of you know, the right family, right? Mm -hmm. We remember how important it was to Abraham that Isaac, his son, not marry mm -hmm. one of these women, that Jacob goes away, like don't marry one of these women. So it seems like it's not because they're following God that things are hard, but maybe because they're making some of those like Hagar-esque type decisions. You know what I mean? M make, take some detours from the plan or some deviations from from the original idea. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how does Lot get in trouble? Because he chose to live that way. Why does Abraham get in trouble with Hagar and Ishmael? Because he chose to have this relationship with her, did, you know, mm -hmm. and so on. So I was wondering about that. Like, they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca. Like, that's pretty harsh. And later in chapter 27, Rebecca says, I'm weary of my life because mm -hmm. of the Hittite women. Oh, If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women such as these, what good will my life be? Ooh, someone's going gets through a, a little bit of depression, huh? I know. Like real despair showing up there. So I don't know what, I don't know what details I'm missing, but like, if you think you have a difficult relationship with your parents-in-law, like, mm -hmm. so did these ladies, like rough times over there for Esau's wife, uh, wives and, and Esau's mother. Hmm. Interesting. So th this passage seems to be, I, it feels uh, like, like I'm missing something here. There's, there's a conflict over what, like I'm reading in the NLT uh, and kind of the heading for today's passage is this, this concept of conflict over water rights, which we, we mentioned briefly in Genesis 21. This is kind of where the well was initially dug. There's this initial meeting with Abimelech. Um, and then it just kind of surfaces again, actually the, the, the same Abimelech, which we'll see uh, kind of right before this episode and the episode after this, like Abimelech shows up again as one of these figures, but there's this conflict around water, which seems kind of, well, I guess I have to put myself back in kind of the ancient Near East where water is hard to get. So, and is that, is it, is it just as trivial as they had a dispute over water or is there something deeper when it comes to the idea of this well because it seems like people are, are are digging their heels in when it comes to this specific well yeah what we see here in uh, in genesis 26 is isaac is now trying to find his place in the land so mm. we remember abraham moved around a bunch but he has a bunch of herds and stuff like that now we see isaac um getting into agriculture Hmm. and trying to find his place. So herds and agriculture, all those things require water. Right. If you're going to grow your wealth, if you're going to sustain your family and what is growing into kind of a tribe, you need to have water. Water establishes also like a geographical claim of sorts, right? Hmm. Like imagine what it takes to dig a well right. in 2000 BC. Hmm. Like this is not an, you don't just like, call in a company and pay them some money and then they dig it for you. Like you're digging a well, like super deep into the ground and building your whole architecture around that. So it's pretty time intensive. Isaac gives up um, a well and a well again. We see yeah. that he's not eager to fight for his rights and he wants to have peace in the land. So hmm. we see that about Isaac. But imagine the struggle that it might be and this, this may be where it's going to relate more to our listeners, where God has just said to Isaac, he's reaffirmed the Abrahamic covenant with him right. earlier in this chapter. I will make your offspring numerous, and I will give to your offspring all these lands, and the nations of the earth will gain blessings for themselves through your offspring. Okay, cool. So this, in other words, you've promised this land to my family, hmm. but now I'm trying to live here, and thank you for all the grain. I need water. Okay, this one is turned into a fight. Fine, you can have it. This one's turned into a fight. Okay, you can have it. So what's the deal? Where, Like, where am I going to get this water? How am I going to live in this land? How are my offspring going to prosper? First of all, I only have two sons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as as in terms of making them very numerous as the stars of the sky, like you have a lot of work to do. 
But secondly, how are you going to like, I can't even, how am I going to get the land? I can't even live here. Like every time I turn around, somebody's like, oh, no, that's mine. Oh, no, get out of here. Like there's disputes everywhere I turn. So what is the deal? Is this promise really coming to pass? Could have been a question that Isaac asked himself. Yeah, what I'm seeing in this is there's almost a passivity to the way that Isaac is going about his sojourning in in, in the land, which which is interesting because I I feel like Abraham maybe wouldn't have been so passive about it. It seems like Abraham was kind of like a little bit more of a go getter, and I'm wondering if Abraham maybe would have fought people for the land. Maybe I don't know, but it seems like Isaac is like, all right, cool. That's not the one. It doesn't seem like he's discouraged over the obstacles that show up in seeking out God's promise for him and his family. He shows up in the land. Someone says, hey, that's mine. He's like, oh, I mean, all right. Oh, okay, you can have that one. I'll go dig another one. And then they're like, no, that's ours too. Like, all right, well, okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll keep moving it. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I feel like Isaac is willing to just keep going on because he's not getting discouraged by the kind of hostility that he's experiencing. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I don't know that Abraham would have fought for it either because one time he had a land dispute, he let the other guy choose oh, that's the true. better yeah. spot. Mm -hmm. And then the only time he fought was to rescue that guy who maybe shafted him on the deal. So, But <laughs> what we do see is after Isaac is, is like, okay, you can have that well, I'll dig another one. And then that one also gets disputed. He moves on again. And then that very night, the Lord appeared to him and then reaffirms the covenant again. So mm. right there, Isaac builds an altar and worships the Lord and digs a well again, and then makes a peace a peace covenant with Abimelech, and Beersheba finally gets established, like for real, for real this time. We hope <laughs> so. So his in his patience and his unwillingness to like sit in offense and revenge and like grabbing after what like he could have and like clinging to his rights. That all paid off because God reaffirms the promise to him, brings peace right to his doorstep, settles him, establishes him. And of course, we know, taking the very long view, God absolutely fulfills that covenant in the generations that follow, and then ultimately fulfills it in the mind-blowing way Isaac never could have imagined through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So God came through. It pays off. Yeah, I, it, it, it is it is interesting how consistently, well, one, that God keeps coming through, but God keeps reminding them. And and I love that because to me, it, it indicates that, it's, you know, it's okay for us to maybe get discouraged when circumstances don't work our way. And that there is still yeah. value in returning back to the promises of God. The circumstances, that whether they're failures, because obviously, uh, you know, there's kind of this whole Isaac following in the footsteps of his father in the previous episode, like, there's, there's these moments where we can get discouraged and wonder, is God still with me? Is the promise still valid? And God keeps showing up and says, no, no, I, I'm still here. You, you might've made a mistake or two, but I'm still here and I'm honoring the, the promise that I've given you. And I like to see how Isaac here gives us an opportunity to see demonstrated how to wait for that promise well. Yeah. It's not by scrambling and it's not by trying to force other people to see God's vision and do it our way and get hmm. us what we deserve and what God promised us. But we're going to, we can fall back. We can let other people um, do what they're going to do and not, you know, be all stirred up and let it change our course. We'll stay the course with God and we'll let him take care of fulfilling the promise. That's, I think, what it means to wait well. And I love to see that here in the life of Isaac. Hey guys, we don't actually have anything to plug other than I would love to hear your guys' opinions on this season of The Move. We're about halfway through season three. It's kind of crazy to think about that. I think this is, if the lineup doesn't change by the time that this episode airs, this is uh, episode number 48 in our season, and we're kind of looking at roughly around 100 episodes. And so I would love to hear your guys' feedback on what you have been enjoying and maybe what you would want to tweak or nudge in one direction or the other. We, we jokingly say, it's not really a joke, but we say at the beginning of every, every episode that it's, you know, 10 minutes at a time. And obviously this season has been trending much longer than that. And so I'm just curious, how do you guys feel about that? I know that a lot of you guys listen to this in commutes or while you work out. And so I just want to get some feedback. No, should we, should we continue to kind of 
push the envelope as far as longer episodes? Do you prefer the shorter ones? Do you not care? Do you just feel like it's all good and you're just happy to vibe with us? Just curious about feedback, anything that you would have to say, any things that you'd want to tweak, very much interested in how we can make the experience better for you, the listener. So if you have any ideas, you can hit me up on Instagram at jkoo, J-K-H-O-E, or you can send me an email at hello at justinkoo.com.